Coming up this week on Sporting Journal Radio. New Red Lake walleye limits have come out. Topwater sturgeon bite on otter tail. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. What? Topwater hot dog sturgeon. You thought you lost it like 27 times. <laughs> Danny's getting all nervous because he kept saying you lost it. And all, you know, it's... Casting for the Prairie Sportsman Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. Heck yeah. This is Sporting Journal Radio. That's right. Welcome to the show. I'm Brett Amundsen. That's. That's well, wild. It's hockey season. It's playoffs, baby. Playoffs. Playoffs? Wild playoffs. We're excited about it. And uh, I don't know, are we going to talk about hockey today, Dan? What's, I don't know. What's with the hockey horns? Just... <laughs> <laughs> I know we're not going to talk about football. I want to confuse people today. Well, I don't know why. You're doing a good job of it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nailed Dan it. Amundsen over there, along with David Eckhart. How you, how you fellas doing? Doing great. Uh, do you have any, do you have water in your basement, David? A little bit. Yeah. But there's water in my basement every year, so <laughs> it's, it's a normal thing. We'll get it in this basement a lot when it rains heavy in the in, you know in the spring and summer. But I can't believe that the basement's dry right now. You know, so so much of our our listening and viewing area is flooded right now. A lot of the rivers are flooded. But even in the last few days, uh, I've watched a lot of the water come down. So hopefully we're we're kind of coming out of it right now. But I'm sure some of the major rivers still have. Are you are you following any of the major rivers, Dan? What major For rivers? flood stage? I don't like, know Mississippi. Oh yeah, the Minnesota. Mississippi. Is, I don't follow the Minnesota, but Mississippi is uh, like Everett's Resort. Our friends over at Everett's are sandbagging, and they're pretty nervous about what's going on. There's a lot of water over there. Um, they're telling people to don't come fish it. All the Red Wing, all the public launches over there are closed. Everett's is closed, so you're not going to the river. I'm guessing the St. Croix. Well, actually, I would. I haven't looked at the St. Croix numbers, but I would bet my bank account that it's. Uh, at the no wake uh, stage. So if you go there, you're running no wake. It'll probably be like that for a while. So there's a lot of water in a lot of places and fishing is going to be tough for a lot of people. There's, I can think of one place I would go fish right now and only one species I'd be fishing for if I went to that place. Um, uh, probably sailfish. Sailfish on the Pacific Ocean. Yep. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Did you just... <laughs> Random side story. Uh... I, so we do this thing with the glow called the outdoor feed. So if you go to the outdoor org, you'll just get uh, updated daily stories <clears throat> from outdoors uh, around the world uh, from members of a glow. It's kind of a neat deal. Uh, but somebody shared a story about scientists found fish five miles deep in the ocean. Snail Follow fish, the science. Right? Snail fish, they're called. So that's what made me think of it was a sailfish. But could you imagine living five miles below the surface? Just pitch black, cold. Man. Uh, outdoorfeed.org's got that story. All right. Uh, so we're going to talk about fish. We're going to talk about uh, what the conditions are like. We'll talk about the Rainy River and uh, what the Forks are doing. Little Fork uh, broke out. I guess they're both, uh, at, especially by the time you watch this or listen to this, both the Big Fork and Little Fork have let loose. Uh, so the the Rainy has is, uh, is got a lot of, probably a lot of debris in it right now. Some muddy conditions. But uh, we'll get a report from Joe Henry coming up later in the show. We'll also talk to Randon Olson. We'll talk about sturgeon in Ottertail County. Now, that's kind of a, um, a under underrated place to go catch sturgeon, but should it be? Dan, I think we got to go there this year. We have a plan in mind. <laughs> we'll talk about our plan later. <laughs> With this Randon. Is, yeah, this is a... <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> David, when are you going to start targeting uh, flatheads? When does that open and when does it get... It doesn't get good till like um, later in the year, right? Later in the summer? Yeah, I usually don't try and go till June. June? Yeah. Let the river come down. and The river might not be down by <laughs> June. Like, and I'm not kidding. No, I know you're not. I fished them in high water, but it's not flooding and raging speeds. So I don't know. We'll see. When is do you know when that when's that season open? I don't even know. Generally, I when. think it's open right now, isn't it? I don't know. I'd fact check look. us. Look look it up on your phone. Yeah, well, I know check. it's at least kind of frowned upon to target them in the winter because they're can be uh, easy to catch and vulnerable. Oh, I'm like fifty, like seventy five percent sure 
it's open right now. But not, but you're exactly right. Nobody's really fishing for them. <clears> but I think the season is open. Well, because they because they end up in a they'll all kind of get together in a, in and they'll congregate in some areas and you'll see just giant flatheads all together and they're uh, they're they're easy to snag. I think they're real kind of lethargic, but uh, so they're they're susceptible to 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 um, you know. It, it's not healthy for him to get caught, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, keep talking. We're looking it up. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Just kill time. So the one, so flathead catfish get very big in Minnesota. Yeah, I don't know. There's been a few guys that have caught them and done some YouTube videos in the winter and they get hammered for it because, uh, what'd you find out there, David? You looked at me. Uh, like, I'm getting there. Anyway. Timing is everything. <laughs> and missed it. Right. Channel catfish is continuous. Flathead catfish is, um, I have it here. Flathead catfish, inland waters, Minnesota, April 1, 23 through November 30th. You can keep two, only one over 24 inches in combination with channel catfish. There you go. So April 1st. April 1st, it's open. Nobody it's open keeps... Now. Flathead, so no. that's all you need to know. Once in a while, I know even like uh, I was with Darren Troseth, and I was kind of surprised he didn't mind if people kept a small one to eat or something like that. They're supposedly very good to eat. I've heard they're better than channels, and we've ate we've eaten some pretty good channel catfish. Yeah, I, so I like catfish. Yeah, I would like to try some flathead. flats, but it's <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> kind of taboo. It's it's hard to keep a flathead. But I mean, again, it's I, if you look at it in a in the sense if. You're keeping you're keeping one to eat. You're gonna do it right and process and take care of it. And you're doing a, a sustainable size. I mean, obviously the the population isn't in danger, right? No. I mean, people just just don't like to keep them because they get so big and they're a great trophy fish. Right. You, you know, and it's, I don't want to compare them to musky, but in a sense, it's kind of like musky. Probably better table or, fare or bass. It's like the or idea bass. of keeping a bass. Yeah. It's it's not a bad thing to do, but. God forbid I put a knife into a bass. I'll, someone will put a knife in my head. <laughs> it's, yeah, people don't like it. Well, anyway, let's plan a flathead trip this year. I want to do it. I want to catch a big flathead. Absolutely. My biggest is no. like five pounds. It's a good eater. You, you tell me when and we'll go. All right. Uh, all right. No. So uh, speaking of eaters and limits, uh, new Red Lake walleye limits have come out. Um, I'll tell you what, we're going to get into Red Lake crappies and walleyes and uh, talk about why they think why what's the DNR's reasoning to go to a five fish limit because I think we were all surprised when we heard that it was a five fish limit this year on red so why did they do that we'll dig into it but first Dan who are the sponsors I wondering if I was going to get to do this on this week's show on X hunt on X maps know where you stand with on X live target match the hatch at live target lures.com Lake of the Woods tourism Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital no matter what people at Lake Erie say plan a trip for this <laughs> summer at lake of the woods mn.com hey Bell Heights campground and resort book a trip to Devil's Lake this summer learn more at hey Bell Heights.com Al Claire audio save your hearing in the field this turkey season with Al Claire learn more at Al Claire outdoors.com otter tail lakes country find your inner otter otter tail lakes country.com and this week on Prairie Sports, and we go fishing in Otter Tail Lakes Country. I think that's our episode this week. Uh, we go musky fishing with Rand, and I'm pretty sure, even if that's not the case, check out the new episode on Sunday on the Prairie Sports on YouTube channel, or uh, check your TV guide for local Prairie Sports and listings. Can confirm musky fishing with Rand and Olson this Sunday on Prairie Sportsman. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we'll be celebrating a wild victory. I'm just going to hit that every time something exciting happens or I get something right. <laughs> Man, I just don't want any more double overtimes. At least I, it's exciting, but not when it's at one o'clock yeah, in the morning. It was so exciting. You slept through the whole thing. <laughs> I tried, tried so hard to stay awake, uh, but I couldn't do it. You know, you're watching hockey you're maybe having a couple cold ones. And next thing you know, it's like six hours later and the game's still going on. See, Dan, that's why they have shootouts during the regular season. I know. It doesn't mean I have to like it. I I saw a post no, the other day that said uh, 10 minutes of three on three would be better than a shootout. And I agree. I wasn't yeah. a fan of the three on three at first, but I love it now. I don't want to see it in the playoffs. I think the way it is in the playoffs is good. Yeah. Shootouts suck. It should not be a skills competition to decide the winner of a 60 minute hockey game. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think a three on three is is almost the same as a shootout in the sense. That Except they're still playing hockey. I mean, but a shootout's still playing hockey. Not really. It's like a breakaway. It's part. It's a. It's a hundred percent part of a game. Just like a three on three is not a part of a game unless there's a couple of fights and both teams have two guys in the penalty box. Like a shootout is more like a realistic part of a hockey game than a three on three is. No, it's not. A hundred percent, it is. You don't. <laughs> 
There's <laughs> passing in three on three. There's every element of hockey in three on three. There's one element of hockey in a shootout, and that is trying to score a goal or to not score. A goal. All right. Well, let's get. So, we'll talk more grief. fishing. You know, we'll get back to hockey next week on this outdoors <laughs> show. Anyway, reel it in. <laughs> Almost as controversial as a shootout in hockey is the Red Lake walleye limits. And uh, this year, five walleyes with one over 17 is what they've announced. We all got a little surprised about that. Uh, The DNR said that the 2019 class is super abundant and those fish are now 15 inches. So they're going to start becoming spawning walleyes. Uh, just just for reference, last year was four walleyes with only one over 20. So what they have now is this this very strong year class of 15 inch fish, and they want to try to uh, knock that down. So their reasoning was that uh, too many spawners is not always better on Upper Red Lake. And first time I read that, I was like, God, and I don't know Red Lake that well. Like I've only fished it, I think one time when we filmed out of the double decker up there. So I don't know Red all that well, but immediately when you tell me, wait a minute, too many spawning walleyes is a bad thing on, on, on paper. That sounds like a great problem to have. So I did a little bit of digging and my first thought is forage. And I think ultimately that becomes the issue because when you have too many spawning walleyes and too many, you know, those young hungry fish, they're out there eating, eating everything. So, uh, I looked up, uh, a book. There's a book that came out in 2022 by Paul Radomski. He was a biologist. He put out a book called Walleye, A Beautiful Fish of the Dark. Uh, going back, I guess he did all the radio and TV show uh, interview circuit last year to push this book. So you probably heard about it. Uh, but um, it seems really interesting. And he specifically talked about Red Lake saying a low walleye abundance to recovery in the lake was creating high negative density dependent effects on young walleye growth and survival. So what that means is it, it, it was just depleting the forage base. So it created a near collapse of yellow perch. It created a slow growth rate for the walleyes. Uh, there was a high walleye natural mortality. A few of the large female walleye were not producing eggs. They're reabsorbing their eggs before spawning. I suppose it was nature's way of saying, hey, the conditions aren't very good right now. Let's not make. There's enough. We don't need more. Yeah. And and it's like Dan and I were talking off the air becomes kind of a carrying capacity in the uh, in the fishery. Uh, There was also a parasite infestation, which I I suppose anytime you get too many, you know, it's like bird flu and you get too many overpopulation snow geese or uh, seed up with too many deer. Uh, and then and then it also had high angler catch rates. So essentially they ate themselves out of house and home is what Paul talks about in this book. He interviews a couple of uh, biologists. The growth rates slowed, fitness levels came down and there was no forage. So then they also resorted to cannibalism. So they're starting to eat themselves. So this happened, I guess, something similar happened back in, must have been 2014 or so, 2015, because they had a revised harvest plan in 2015 that took an aggressive approach to harvesting walleye during a surplus condition like this. And it wasn't just to harvest the surplus, but actively manage the surplus spawning biomass back down to optimal condition. They went on to manage for optimal female biomass rather than stockpiling excessive spawner biomass. There's a lot of like biology speak in this description. Follow the science. Follow the science. So uh, what they say, they made a change. They removed the protective slot that the lake had. They replaced it with a one over type regulation and then increased the creel limit. So basically kind of what they're doing this year. And they found that the perch came back, uh, gold eye came back. I guess the lake used to have a lot of gold eye. Well, they disappeared during that time when they had that surplus before. And then uh, after they dropped that spawning biomass, the gold eye returned and then the lake uh, had a, a healthy recovery and came back. So. That's what they're doing right now. They're basically trying to keep the lake in balance and they got too many too many of those 15 inch fish. And if they leave those 15 inch fish out there, uh, the, the lake could, could see a crash again in the forage base, which obviously is gonna affect the walleye population. So that is why they have five limits or five fish with one over 17 this year for Red Lake. What do you think? We'd love to hear from you. Comment below if you have uh, an opinion on the Red Lake limits or other limits. You know, one other thing about Red Lake, I was when I was researching this, I noticed uh, um, McComas had something in a Target Walleye article about a month ago. And I didn't, you know, I again, I don't follow Red Lake too closely. And I know that crappie fishing on Red has been pretty good. Have you guys ever fished crappies on Red Lake? Nope. No. 
<laughs> Neither is Alex Trebek, apparently. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I was never up there for the big crappie boom back in the 90s, and I, I had heard good things about crappies this past year. I didn't expect it to be this dramatic. So uh, I don't know if this, I don't know if, if Brett found this info, or I know he referenced, I think, a Brad Dawkin article, maybe in the Grand Forks Herald. Um, but at some point, there was a creel survey that said around 900 walleyes on, or crappies, around 900 crappies on average were getting caught the previous 10 years. This last year was 15,000. Whoa. So was, yeah, so from 900 crappies a year by, caught by anglers on red to 15,000. So he, Brett's big thing was just, hey, 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 okay, the crappie fishing is pretty good right now. Everybody just whoa <laughs> everybody just slow down whoa. you don't need to keep every fish that you catch out of there so uh pretty interesting stuff about red lake what do you think let me know about your experiences up on red you can comment below we got to take a quick break but we got uh, rand and olson coming up in just a little bit to talk about otter tail county and sturgeon fishing in otter tail county and then also limits he's actually done something really cool as a guide he has put some self-imposed limits on his uh, on his client catches so we're going to talk about what that is coming up and why he did that also joe henry will have a rainy river report for us and i found some pretty interesting uh research D digging into this walleye stuff a little bit more i found some pretty interesting research that came out of uh, lake erie and lake huron and about how far walleyes will travel at, after they spawn like throughout the year like their migration pretty interesting stuff we'll tell you what that is when we come back live target the leader and match the hatch is back with new lures that also match the action introducing the live craw the live craw is irresistible to bass walleye and other freshwater species f winner the ultimate frog looks and acts just like a swimming frog with an exposed ultra point mustad hook and replaceable legs the ultimate frog has two styles two sizes and eight colors and i cast an f winner the live shrimp mimics a fleeing shrimp for saltwater angle Coming soon from Live Target. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. We're back, Sporting Journal Radio. Thanks for tuning in wherever you're watching or listening to this. I'm Brett Amundsen, along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. Uh, that's right. <laughs> I can't get over that button. That's my new favorite button. Playoffs are here. Go wild. Hey, uh, got a study I want to talk about real quick before we get into uh, more limit talk and uh, walleyes and sturgeon with Randon, and then also a Rainy River Fishing Report with Joe Henry coming up. But I was doing some research about wa the walleye spawn and how much walleyes travel and how much walleyes come back to their same spawning area. So there was a study done in 2011 and 2012 in the Great Lakes. It was Lake Erie and Lake Huron. And they went to a couple of the spawning rivers and tagged 500 walleyes. And then they tracked them for a couple of years. And they found that 95% of the walleyes in Lake Huron went back to the main river that they spawned in, whereas 70% went back in, in uh Lake Erie, but that Lake Erie had a couple of other spawning areas, so they figured they were just uh, picking the best, closest one. Uh, but the coolest part of that research is they found that those walleyes took a 500 mile round trip migration every year. So they spawned in the river and then they traveled 250 miles up the lake to wow. their feeding grounds in Northern Lake Huron, and then turned around and came on, came back 250 miles. So. You think about that, and we we learned about that tag sturgeon research last week on the show on the Rainy River and how so many of those fish were tagged in Four Mile Bay and then caught just a couple of miles away on the river, but 20 years later, right. those fish might have gone way up into Canada. Yeah, and who Bay. knows where. Or maybe they just stayed all, all in the same place. But Maybe to the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> well, my camera died. Look at that. I'm looking at something. <laughs> looking at your phone, probably. No. Tinder. No. <laughs> no. I don't use that. 250 mile 
one way for those walleyes. Uh, really interesting information. A Great Lakes Fishery Commission study. You can uh, Google and find out more about that if you want to. All right. Uh, we've got Randon Olson coming up from Lockjaw Guide Service in Ottertail County. Joe Henry with Lake of the Woods Tourism and more fishing talk, including how we use live scope up on the Rainy River to catch walleyes. All coming up on Sporting Journal Radio. So I said, okay, yeah, I forgot we were going to talk about Prairie Sports. We've got a new episode of Prairie Sports. I'm coming up with Randon, but we didn't talk about last week's show where we did uh, some layout boat duck hunting up at the Northwest Angle, and this is what it looked like. On this episode of Prairie Sportsman, join us as we explore a unique duck hunting opportunity on Lake of the Woods with layout boats. And we'll also take a look at the installation of accessible fishing piers at lakes across the state making it easier for everyone to enjoy the great outdoors. Don't miss this action-packed episode of Prairie Sportsman. Kodiak, a North American waterfowl film, is coming to the Fish Hunt Forever YouTube channel. I've been a sea duck hunter for about 30 seconds, and I've already got one that's probably going to go on the wall, so this is the coolest duck hunt I've ever been on. Presented by Boss Shot Shells, with support from Sitka and Beretta, and additional support from Alclair Outdoors, High Prairie Animal Arts, and the Association of Great Lakes Outdoor Riders. Watch Kodiak on the Fish Hunt Forever YouTube channel. Northern Minnesota's Walleye Factory is a year-round world-class fishing destination. The perfect getaway this summer is just a short drive to Lake of the Woods. Fish Big Traverse Bay, the Rainy River, or visit the unique Northwest Angle. To catch big fish, you have to go where the big fish are. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. That's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. All right, this is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen along with David Eckhart and Dan Amundsen over there. Thank you for tuning in on the network by demand or by watching this on YouTube. We're going to talk uh, fishing with Randon Olson right now from Lockjaw Guide Service. Randon, how you doing, man? Doing pretty dang good. It's a little chilly outside, so I'm stuck in the garage for the day. That's not. You can't even say that it's cold right now, now that we finally, finally have some semblance of spring out there. Well, I'm not going to complain that it's too hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, it's uh, it, it, it's basically the beginning of open water season. Obviously, there's only still a couple places, rivers that you can do it. But uh, how excited are you uh, to be back in a boat and off the ice? Um, I'm pumped. That's, you know, I get that question a lot. And I love fishing no matter if it's winter or summer or whatever it is. But I don't know. There's just something about being in a boat that makes fishing better if it can be how do you feel about that dan i wasn't listening i'll be honest i was (laughs) dealing with something else so you can't you can't just catch me off guard like that oh what you do all the time you're part of the show i I am but (laughs) i'm making sure everything sounds good and looks good i'm doing my job ask david those questions that's what he's here for so dan i'm just going to repeat the question to give you one more chance because we were talking about how much how there's just something about being in a boat to fish versus being on the ice so what's what's the question? You didn't Are ask you ready a question to fish there. in a boat. Am I ready? Versus ice. Well, yeah, I've been doing that for three months. Now. Yeah. All right, but let's move on. Thanks. <laughs> I thought he was giving Dan a chance to really have a moment here on the show. You but. wanted me to just go off on ice fishing. Yeah, pretty I'm much. I'm past that. We're yeah. past ice fishing. I'm past my anger towards winter. It's open water season now. Here we go. All right. So, Randon, we we had a, we've been fishing the Mississippi and obviously got up on the rainy a little bit, doing some open water stuff. I know we we missed you guys. I think we were both up on the rain at the same time. We probably we probably went by each other on the river and just didn't even realize it. Uh, how was your How was your trip up there? We did okay. It was it was a steady steady day. You know, we caught fish throughout the whole day. Um, crankbaits was our best shot, but when we'd find a little pot of fish, we'd stop and pitch some jigs and and rattle baits and blade baits and spinner baits and kind of just throwing whatever we had out there just to see what we could catch fish on. Um, no giants. I think 24 and a half was our biggest. <laughs> That's a great picture. <laughs> yeah. 24. Uh, the, weather, the weather was gorgeous. I mean, we all got sunburnt. We could feel it on the way home. We had some hot dogs out in the river. <laughs> we go up there. We don't plan on coming off the river till we go home. So everything comes in the boat. Yeah. Which day were you up there? Was it Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday. 
Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, Tuesday was great. I my nose is just finally starting to peel from the sunburnt I got on Tuesday last week up there. Oh. Uh, yeah, it sounds like we we uh, hit it just right cuz it sounds like they opened up the dam on uh, Rainy Lake Tuesday night. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Things are pretty dirty come Wednesday. Yeah, and that and it was. We fished Wednesday obviously up there things were definitely dirtier. We kind of switched to uh to sturgeon fishing and you know, I, I don't know if you'll have an opinion. I don't know how much sturgeon fishing you do, Randon, but uh Darren Troseth brought up uh something in one of the Facebook groups about everybody talking about sturgeon fishing when the river muddies up he says i always find it's better when the water is a little bit clearer and and that may be the case but i think as far as the rainy goes when it gets a little bit muddier walleyes are just harder to catch so people just go to try to catch a sturgeon at that time do you do you do much sturgeon fishing i dabble in it here you know we've got a ton of them in otter tail lake and the whole river system there um, and I've been kind of slowly progressing to, to learning more about sturgeon and how they work and how to catch them and that stuff. And, uh, man, we got a hell of a fishery here for the sturgeon. It's just a matter of figuring out the puzzle. Well, I'll tell you what, I know David, you've, you've been a big fish fishing guy when it comes to like flatheads for a long time. Yeah. And Dan, Dan and I, Dan, I know has really, really gotten on the sturgeon train here this year. And now that we've got some gear for it, you know, some heavy rods and reels and, you know, have an idea. I think, Randon, I think we're going to be coming up to Otter Tail County to try to catch some of those sturgeon here this summer for sure. Heck yeah, help me out. You know, it's, it's one thing when they're in the river, you, they can't really go too far. But yeah. I don't know, you get to Otter Tail Lake and there's 15,000 acres. It's a little daunting to sit still somewhere and wait. <laughs> right. I mean, what do you do? You try to find, are there some, maybe some holes, some, some sort of structure that you might try to post up on there to see if you can't get a sturgeon roaming through? See, so that's, that's what kind of trips me up is I, I tend to see more of them and follow more fish. I'm a, I'm a shallow walleye fisherman um, just by nature, but I, t I see so many sturgeon up shallow that there's got to be a, a shallow bite and, I mean, you guys have probably seen Otter Tail Lake. Otter Tail Lake is like 75% of the whole lake is 10 foot or less. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's kind of a needle in a haystack out there. And it, we're slowly figuring out places where I'm I'm consistently seeing fish and catching a few here and there. But um, it's just, a, it's, it takes time. All right. I've got a new idea, guys, for uh, the Fish on Forever YouTube channel. Randon, we'll come film with you again this summer up there. Top water sturgeon bite on otter tail. I'm, I'm in. What? Top water hot dog sturgeon. Yeah, there we go. Do, do you see them? You know, you, you know how you'll see them surface and jump up on the rainy or on uh, some of the river systems. Do you see them surface on otter tail? All the time, all the time, and and they're getting brave. We had one last year actually broke a rod as we were trolling, pulling crankbaits. It jumped right next to the boat and landed on the rod. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy how big are yeah, they getting on the, in that system now uh we had a 57 that we pulled up last year um Dang. that we caught while walleye fishing um i would say most of the ones i see out there are in that 40 to 50 range inch wise um and that that seems to be pretty common oh, those are nice fish and i know they i think they they kind of grow you know they get up near that 40 inch mark f fairly quickly but uh then they start to slow down a little bit and I, we've seen it like in big stone and the minnesota river they did some some stocking there in uh, recent years and they're starting to grow uh get to some decent catching catchable sizes uh out there now too so man anytime but i don't i don't care anytime you get over 40 inches that's a big fish that i don't care what fish. you're catching and then you start talking about 50 inch what fish about you whales know? It's not a big whale. It's still a big. Well, if you caught it on a on an ultralight rod, it would be. Well, sure. Who does that though? Well, you caught, I'm just saying. You caught that 50 inch sturgeon on a medium light rod, and that was pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't recommend that. Hot, that's the new episode: hot dog, ultralight rod, sturgeon fishing. Exactly. <laughs> that sounds like a terrible idea, David. <laughs> so, Randon, when that sturgeon broke your rod, is that, is that when you decided just to start making your own? Uh, I've been doing it for a while. Um, you know, one of the things of being a fishing guide is, is you got people using your stuff all the time and you get eyelets that get broken or hook keepers gone or something like that. Um, so, and I didn't take any classes or anything. I've just kind of YouTube university did this, um, sure. kind of figured it out as I went. Um, and it's just, you know, it started fixing eyelets and, and tips and stuff. And then it get to a point where 
rods were getting a little beat up or, or looked dingy or something like that. So you strip everything off, repaint the blank, and just start over. And, um, it's just kind of a – it's something to do this time of year, and, and it keeps all my gear in good shape and ready to go. Can so it have kind of – <laughs> Can, can it handle a Brett Amundsen musky hook set on a suck? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of those where they, they broke halfway down, those could probably handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got an episode of Prairie Sportsman coming this Sunday night on uh, Pioneer PBS, or you can watch it on the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel. I think Sunday's around noon. And uh, we did some fishing with Randon. We fished with you uh, the year before, Randon, where we caught some nice muskies, and we decided to do a round two with you last uh, last September, I think we were up there, and had a great time, and we learned a little bit about how you like to fish them, and how you use your electronics, uh, how you use suckers, and then we hooked up with a fish, and you said, I know we've talked about this before, but what did you tell me right before I set the hook on this fish, Randon? I looked you dead in the eyes and I said, I want you to try to break the rod. <laughs> Don't tempt me with a good time because that's exactly what I did and uh, snapped that rod. We landed the fish, though. It was a lot of fun. And you can see some of the footage. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see some of the footage of our trip uh, out with Rand and Muskie fishing. And uh, Dan and I both caught, you know, our, our best muskies. And uh, uh, obviously, Rand and you, it was all your gear and you did all the work. So I'm going to give you all the credit on the fish. But I got to break the rod trying to bring one of them in. So I'll, I'll take the assist. But, uh, man, that was that was a fun day out there. And th we caught a pretty special muskie out there that day, didn't we? Underbite, yeah, that's a pretty special fish. Uh, not sure which way, what exactly special for that one means, because I think I've <laughs> like, caught that fish about 15 times now in four years, so <laughs> he's, he's becoming a pet. That's hilarious. Um, Randon, before we let you go here, I do want to bring up one pretty important thing that you did uh, this year, which I think is really cool as a guide, particularly. Uh, we're real, everyone's, uh, you know, catch and release is getting more important. People trying to protect the resource and protect the fisheries is becoming uh, more and more important. And you put some self-imposed limits on your guide service this year. I, I did, and, and there was a lot of thought. I've been kind of tossing that around for a couple of years, um, trying to figure out exactly if I should do it or not. Um, but we did, we, we dropped a couple limits in our boat. We went down to four walleyes per person, five crappies and 10 sunfish. Um, and the main reason for this is, is I don't think our fisheries are hurting at all. You know, I want to get, make that clear. We have great fisheries. Um, fish numbers are, are right where they should be. Um, but the reason I, I want to do this is I'm taking people basically seven days a week, yeah. um, two to four people a day. Um, and that's a lot of fish. So if I can keep two fish per person back in the lake, um, that's just going to help sustain fisheries. You know, that's the, that's the bottom line behind it all, just to help sustain fisheries. Well, I think that's great. And if people people want to do some guiding with you or uh, jump in the boat, have you do some guiding for them uh, this summer? When do you start and how can they reach you? I'll start as soon as that ice goes off. Um, you know, we're booked into June right now, the end of June, actually. Um, so we're, we're getting out there quite a ways now. But if a guy wants to get out with me, Best thing to do is give me a call at 218-640-0158. Um, otherwise, we're on Facebook at Lockjaw Guide Service or lockjawguideservice.com. Randon Olson, thanks for the time today on the show. Joe Henry's coming up next. Did you know there are more than 1,000 lakes in Ottertail County? Yep, and I'm going to fish as many as I can. I'm an outdoorsy otter. Nothing beats a full day of fishing for me. The lakes of Ottertail County give me plenty of options to lower my boat and snag the perfect catch. Not an outdoorsy otter? No problem. Ottertail County has something for everyone. You just need to find your inner otter. To find your inner otter, go to ottertaillakescountry.com. Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Haybell Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Haybell Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybellheights.com. That's haybellheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today. We're back. Time to check in with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism. Joe, how you doing? Hey, Brett. Doing good. How are you? Long time no see, right? <laughs> That's right, man. What a great time we had up at the Rainy last week. 
That uh, that tournament you put on, Brett, was, was obviously the second annual, but I mean, it was really, really a neat, neat deal. You know, this year the weather worked out, but I was even thinking, you know, I had, I think I was talking to you and you're almost like, you know, it was almost cooler the year before when there was a snowstorm. But nonetheless, it's one of the neat things. I was thinking about the Rainy River and the spring fishing. And it's one of those deals where you just have to make plans and go, and then you adapt to the conditions. If if the water gets really muddy, then you fish sturgeon. If the water's clear and you're whacking walleyes, then you go that route. I mean, w- both years we've had a great time, and the, everybody that's have attended has said, you know what, what a cool deal. It was a lot of fun and uh, a neat place to do it. And of course, the snowstorm the year before gave us a story. The nice weather this year gave us sunburn. Uh, but <laughs> both years we caught fish, and and this year, yeah, the second day of the tournament it muddied up a little bit. And uh, I mean, we had a beautiful day before the tournament. We had a beautiful day first tournament. Actually, had a pretty nice day for the second day of the tournament as well. But the river got a little muddy, so we focused on sturgeon. And Dan and I, uh, we only caught two, but there were two nice ones to catch and our, our personal bests. That nice. one right there was an adventure. That'll still go down as one of the most exciting fish I've probably ever caught, Joe. Incredible, incredible. Sh- well, you know, a cool photo, but I saw that video that you posted on that uh, fish dodging icebergs. You thought you lost it like 27 times. <laughs> Danny's getting all nervous because he kept saying you lost it and all, you know. It was, but that's uh, what what an adventure. You know, I got to tell you, it's funny because, you know, there's always naysayers out there, right? And there's some naysayers that were saying before that day of fishing, go home, the water's dirty, go home, go home. It's not even worth coming up, you know. And, well, you know, we went out and targeted walleyes for the day and, we caught, uh, oh, more than a dozen walleyes. We got a 28.75-inch walleye that probably went over 10 pounds. And we caught uh, two sturgeon on walleye gear. We got a 59.75, and there's my 61. So just goes to show, you know what, you just got to go fishing, and uh, normally good things happen. 61 inches, you know, I caught that fish, and to me it was like bringing Moby into the boat. You know, like it was it was a heavy fish. We battled it hard. It was a, a long fight. There was just a lot of aspects to it. Dan at one point's like, well, which is it? Did you lose it? Do you still have it? My undies were in a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. There's no doubt. It, it was an adventure. But, um, you know, it was funny, like the boat kind of next to us was was they were kind of cheering us on and then kind of giving us a hard time because, you know, it was it was such a long battle. And we're like, oh, yeah. And they're like, how big was it? Probably expecting it to be like 80 inches or something based on the fight that we went through. And we're like, oh, 61, you know, but 20, 25 some inch girth, you know, it was big fish. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, we've got like three of those today. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, oh, Love you. Yeah, it probably would have been better if you guys would have had a net. Well, well, if someone would have answered their phone, it yeah. didn't matter because Joe had it anyway. Yeah, true. <laughs> How many? So you and and Scott, we were, everybody was borrowing Scott's net that oh, day. Like we would drive by a, a random boat, like, oh, you need a net? <laughs> you could have made so much money. Everyone else that turned out. us down. Yeah, we should have rented it out. Well, but, we were really lucky because you know we were using just regular walleye gear and. Um, you know, David and Scott came by and they're like, hey, do you guys want to use our net? And we're like, you know, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be awesome. Well, I'll tell you what happens when you have a big net like that. The first time you get that sturgeon up and see them, you quick scoop them. And that can save you in some cases uh, 15 minutes to a half hour because those fish will dive back down. They'll stay down again and you start the process over. So that was really good timing on our part. Both sturgeon, they were fishing near us and we got uh, we got to borrow their net. So that was really helpful. Yeah. I, <laughs> if you watch the video, you hear Dan in the background trying to call David. Yep. And there and there's no answer. And why? Because you were catching a fish I, at the same time. I had hooked a northern, and it was the hook was way down in the gills. So I was fishing with the forceps, trying to get it out and get it back in the water. And my phone went off, and I was messing with the fish, and I kind of threw it back and just kept fishing, forgot about it, and. It was probably forty five minutes. I was like, "Oh, somebody tried to call me." Yeah, oh, you what? didn't. You didn't call until we were uh, at the landing. Yeah, you yeah. were back at the landing already. <laughs> like, Thanks, appreciate like, it. Well, oh, you yeah, know somebody what? tried to call one, me. One thing was kind of cool, and David's fishing by you guys. You know, we we're fishing a little bit deeper than you were, but those guys were up on an edge, kind of by shore, and they were using live scope. And you can see, like everybody's watching TV in the boat. Yeah. And we're saying, "What? What are you seeing?" Oh, yeah, it's we, really cool. Wallies are coming up and, and and they're coming up and they're not taking it. So we're trying to tease them. Or we're getting some going that way. We're, we're watching sturgeon come up after our walleye jigs and we're pulling it away from the sturgeon. I mean, they could see all this stuff going on. And I just thought, you know, in addition to the enjoyment of being out there and fishing, think about what you learn 
on uh, regarding the fish behavior by watching that darn live scope. Yeah, it was it was you you got to see just what the fish was doing. You got to be able to um, jig them up, and some of them you'd pull them up six feet before they'd hit. So it was it was interesting to watch the fish behavior, like ice Almost fishing. Like ice yeah, fishing. yeah, it was yeah. exactly. And you have to wonder for guys like us that didn't have live scope. You know, we had some side scan and clear view and all these other uh, ways to, to mark fish, but we weren't able to watch them in, you know, like in real time, basically, yep. like you were with the live scope. Uh, so so the first day didn't bring the and I had a live scope with and you just wonder how many fish I went by that if I would have been able to work the fish a little bit, maybe I would have been able to catch it. So the second day, I'm like, oh, I'm bringing my live scope out here, brought it out battery was dead well and the funny thing God was dang. i walked by you when you parked because i had forgot mine in the truck and i'm like what he's like what are you doing i'm like oh <laughs> forgot my live scope and then he's like oh that sucks and, yeah. and then five minutes later i get a snap from him in the boat already he's like ah, i forgot my live scope pull <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i had to go back for the pole so dan brings me back to landing run have to run halfway down the the road where we parked we had the sneaky parking spot that day though well, yeah it wasn't got lucky wasn't as bad i guess grab the pole get back get all excited take all the live scope stuff out hook up the pole no battery like battery's <laughs> dead and then, uh, so the third day, charged the battery up and brought it out there. But now I had the challenge. I didn't have any sort of mount for the boat for open water. So now I had the challenge of trying to keep that live, you know, just like I was trying to jig with one hand and hold the live scope pole with the other hand. And uh, and it wasn't working very well, especially with river current. So you were telling me to take the rod holder, spin it backwards and tip it up. And that actually worked fairly well. Yeah. It wasn't perfect, but it worked fairly well. By the end of the day of the last day, I kind of had a system down. <laughs> and I was able to watch a couple of sturgeon on it, actually, which was pretty interesting. I watched Dan, when Dan caught his sturgeon, I was able to watch it on the live scope and see him fight this sturgeon on there. And you can see that in our video. But today, this came today right here. And this is my open water boat mount for my live scope pole. So things are, things are happening. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank what, you. What boat are you going to put that on? Your boat. Oh. <laughs> Any boat with a Scotty rod holder mount. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, excited to use the electronics show. And it sounds like uh, the, the people were the, the little fork opened up a few days ago. And as of the recording on Wednesday for this, the big fork just opened up. It sounds like. Yeah, it sure did. Yep. And uh, yeah, they're kind of they, they can track that ice. You know, a lot of a lot of the folks, uh, you know, including Kevin at the Royal Dutchman, but some others as well are doing a nice job of just tracking what's going on up there with. You know the ice busting loose how long the ice pack is where it's where it's at going down the river and you know uh, when that ice pack goes down the river if it's windy and it's pushing ice to one side of the river sometimes you can fish on the other side of the river or if there's ways to get around it or you just wait for that ice pack to roll through you know and uh, but you know the, the good thing about it is is that i mean obviously the walleye fishing ended up the, the last day was april 14th for the spring season but you know um uh, sturgeon season goes through may 15th and Sturgeon will feed even in dirty water conditions, and that's a saving grace. I mean, there's a lot of lot of sturgeon, a lot of big sturgeon are being caught right now, and it's a it's a great time of the year, you know, to get out there before the fishing opener and uh, to catch a fish like that. I mean, you said yourself, so cool to catch a big sturgeon. Well, anytime you talk about, I mean, when you think about the tug is the drug and everybody, you know, even more rough fish are getting more popular uh, just because people like to catch a fish and feel that fight and then release it anyway. When you can catch arguably the biggest fish in the state of Minnesota, you know, uh, the, why not? Why not go after it? And it's you don't need expensive gear. You don't need to, you know, you don't really need to be a great angler to catch them. That they're, it's a pretty easy presentation. I mean, how cool is it to be able to go out and catch a fish that has lived for so long as well, too? I mean, obviously, there's some some techniques and some tips and some safe handling measures and things you need to know. And you should have a, a net or some <laughs> sort of a way to get the fish in the boat. I ended up just grabbing it by the tail and hoisting it in. Um, but that can, that's, that's not easy for everybody. And when you start talking about, a, you know, a hundred pound fish, you're not going to be able to lift that thing in. Um, so yeah, having, exactly. having the right gear is, is obviously yeah. pretty important. Any shorter arms than you have, and you're not a short guy. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't do it. And I think it was just cause my arms are too short and you're, you just have those three inches on me that, that did it. Exactly. Uh, no comment. 
Yeah. <laughs> hey, I told everyone last week how I don't need those extra two inches Brett was trying to give me. <laughs> this, yeah, is, that this, is a, this is a common occurrence, apparently. Let's this is a family clear. show, isn't it? It's yeah, off the rails. Show. Same jeans. Same jeans. <laughs> I'm adopted. That's what, I, that's what my brother and sister kept well, telling me my whole life. <laughs> uh, we, we all look at a family picture. We all look way too alike for that. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Well, I know that that river gets to be real, real popular now for sturgeon anglers, and uh, it's getting more and more popularity with uh, people that like to catch big fish. So I'm sure it's going to be a popular spot. And it's nice now that I, I'm sure all the accesses are open. I, I'm guessing Wheeler's Point is open now. I haven't heard, but well, well actually, I can tell you this. So you know, uh, we, not only is Wheeler's open, um, I was in the boat the next day, and actually, uh, I was in the gap. Um, the water had reached oh, really? the gap. Oh wow! Yep, on, on, on Friday, so we're out in the gap. You know, ice was coming from the bay. But but we were through the gap, so you know things are things are sure happening. And uh, you know the other thing I'll say too is that uh, with a late spring like we've had this year, there's a real good chance that there'll be a good population of walleyes left in that river for the May 13th Minnesota fishing opener. And there'll be there'll be people fishing walleyes in the lake, but there'll also be a you know a, a group of people that are still going to stay in that river and fish them. And you, as you guys know, you can have a small boat and fish them in the river, which is really neat. Well, Joe, I want to talk a little bit more about migrating walleyes next week here on the show. But for now, if people want to learn more about sturgeon fishing on the rainy or planning a summer trip to Lake of the Woods, what should they do? You know, best uh, best route is to check out our website, and that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.